really a pleasure to be back in Trieste. So I was talking to Sophie uh, in the lunch break, and we realized that this has already been like eight years, and, and this was actually the first time the two of us met, and uh, also um, the first time I probably met uh, uh, at least some of you. And uh, ever since, it's been uh, quite an interesting journey, so this feels almost like a family reunion to me. So what I like really a lot about this community is that this is really a truly uh, interdisciplinary community and this is just a, a list of people I was fortunate to publish with in the last couple of years. So there are people from chemistry, biologists. Most of them are physicists, though, and no mathematician to this point. Uh, so, but this may change also in the future. Uh, to give you a small outline, uh, I will present, be presenting to you in the next uh, 40 minutes or so uh, a couple of projects. And the recurring topic of these projects is the application of coarse-grained models. So I'll start off with talking about uh, knots in polymer melts. So if you take out a single chain, what is the probability of being knotted? And what are the consequences for theoretical modeling of these polymers? Then we'll switch gears a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit about coarse-grained modeling of DNA and how likely it is that knots occur in DNA. Then we'll switch gears once again and look how, talk a little bit about dynamics, so how knots can pass through each other. And finally, I'll also talk a little bit about knots in proteins. So this will be more or less a, a general introduction, so we'll, we'll hear more about that probably from Sophie tomorrow. And uh, I'll finish off also with uh, introducing to you uh, a cost grain model with which we can sort of uh, have at least some idea why knots are so rare in proteins. So let me start with something uh, uh, very simple, namely just remind you about knots in random walks. And uh, I have to apologize to all mathematicians at this point. So when I talk about knots, I'll talk about knots in open chains. So that means uh, that we typically have to apply a closure. In most cases, what we'll do is just we'll extend this uh, from the center of mass through the endpoints and make a big loop. And whatever is uh, captured in there um, uh, is analyzed by the use of an Alexander polynomial. So random knots are actually the first models uh, which have also been uh, studied by computer simulation. Uh, here in this paper by Wologotsky et al. in some Russian journal in 1974. And they already realized that knots are uh, very uh, prevalent, so random walks tend to be highly knotted. And if you think about it, this actually makes sense because it's very easy to set up a random walk in, in three-dimensional space. And when you just put one bead after the other with a fixed distance, you create lots of local entanglements, which you can all also see here in this reduced representation of this random walk over here. So lots of local entanglements and also lots of knots. And polymer physicists like this model quite a bit because this is actually one of the few models where you can actually do some hard analytical calculations with. Whenever you have something like excluded volume, uh, the, the arguments in polymer physics get kind of hand-waving, and, and this is the, the, the only model, essentially, or variance of this ideal chain uh, that you can do like real calculations with. So if we go to the slightly more sophisticated model and we add excluded volume interactions, so now the, our beads have some volume, uh, things change tri quite dramatically. Uh, so we go from a highly knotted state in the random walk to an essentially unknotted state. So for instance, if you have a chain of 1,000 beads, the knotting probability, depending on which closure you use, is about 1%. And uh, the reason for this is that all these knots on the local scale, uh, once you introduce volume, are sort of driven off, and you, 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 what you obtain is essentially an unknotted chain. Um, to finish the discussion about single chains, uh, what you can also investigate are chains in bad solvent conditions. So uh, for the computer simulators here, so what you do in your implicit solvent model is essentially turn down the temperature, and, and then the attractive interaction uh, become prevalent, and what you get there is essentially you can test with this polymer over here. So you, if you exert thermal fluctuations to this polymer, and then at some point uh, you find the ends and you pull, and then this ends up typically knotted. And this is exactly what also happens on the molecular uh, level. And it doesn't really make uh, a difference if you put it in a cage, like in the, in the case you can see over here, or if you just let it collapse. Um, both configurations are essentially highly knotted.
All right, after this uh, short introduction, so let me switch gears a little bit and talk about polymer melts. So your polymer melt is essentially uh, a big bowl of very long spaghetti, which you can you know, shake around a little bit, and you end up with a configuration which looks a little bit like this. So it's, it's uh, very much intermingled, and uh, each chain has a different color here, so you can see that it essentially goes back and forth as you would expect. Um, just to, to uh, remind you a little bit about uh, the theoretical aspects of this thing. So in polymer physics and also in chemistry, uh, these chains or chains uh, within such a melt are often modeled as random walks. Yeah? And let me just provide you with some hand-waving argument why this is the case. So this is an argument with, oops, that was a little bit too much. Uh, this uh, goes back to an idea of Flory, and the way I present it can be found in the book of De Gen, the scaling concepts in polymer physics. So if this is your, your chain, or uh, your melt over here, you can paint one of your uh, molecules in one color. So let's paint it red. So if you have spaghetti, you, you, know, you choose one spaghetti which has a different color. And then you look at the concentration profiles. Uh, so this is the center of mass of this single chain. And in the, within, in, the, in the vicinity of the center of mass of this chain, you'll get an increased concentration of that chain. And on the same time, you get a dip in the concentration of the surrounding chains. Yeah? And you, if you add, it, add these two contributions up, you essentially get something like a homogeneous contribution. And what you can do now is you determine the forces occur from intra-chain interactions, and these forces are essentially repulsive. So the, from here, you are sort of pushed downhill, whereas uh, attractive forces arise from this energy uh, minimum over here. And the, the argument goes that uh, overall, there are no effective forces acting on these monomers. And uh, so there are something like no interaction. And therefore, the chain should behave like a random walk. So, um, just to, to briefly remind you how you actually map such chains onto random walks. So you say, essentially, we, we take the mean squared end-to-end -end distance, and uh, they should be the same of the random walk and your chain in the melt, and they should also have the same contour length. That means the maximum extension of your chain should be the same. And when you do that, uh, after some, some, some algebra, um, you see that the effective random walk is somewhat smaller than your chain. And in our case, where we have a flexible chain, it's roughly half the size of the chain. So now we have everything, all the ingredients which we ha uh, need to test this theory if uh, random walk is actually a good representation. And then we look at knotting probabilities. And then something interesting happens. So this is actually a collaboration with a group of um, Henrik Meyer in Strasbourg. So these are people who have been for some time uh, sort of um, arguing that, you know, uh, random walk might not be an ideal representation. Um, so this is the probability of observing a knot in such a melt. So the density is about 0.7, and the chain length is up to 1,000. So these are large-scale molecular dynamic simulations which we've analyzed. And you see here that the probability is uh, slightly below 10%. Yeah? So one out of 10 uh, chains uh, contains a knot. However, if you look at... yes. Yeah, yeah, so these are very long simulations. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so what you can do is you can actually look at individual chains and, and see uh, if the knot is there all the time or if it disappears and you can come up with some time of uh, correlation time. And, and these things, they, they really run for years. Yeah, so this takes a, a huge computational effort. So it's, it's not, not something you do on your laptop. All right? And, and when we compare that with the uh, corresponding random walk, what we see essentially here is that uh, it's highly knotted. Yeah? And there's a large discrepancy between what you observe for your chain in the melt and the random walk, which is actually a first indication that they do not reproduce the structure of the chain. Yeah? And, and this also doesn't change if we change the density of the melt. Of course, in the limit of infinite dilution, we obtain the self-avoiding walk, which we have actually here on this axis more or less, and, but if you increase the, the density a little bit, uh, you actually go up uh, to something like uh, slightly higher than 10%, but, but it doesn't make it really a difference because you, you never go to 80% up here. Yes? 
Okay, the knottedness, essentially. Yeah. So um, we will see later on. I will give some other examples that analyzing knottedness actually is a very fine gauge for the overall structure of a chain. Yeah. And and this we essentially use to 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 say if this is a good representation or not. Say again. Yeah, these are all linear polymers, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and. Um, Something similar can actually be observed uh, when we look at the, the sizes of knots. So again, the sizes predicted by the effective uh, random walk model are much smaller than the sizes observed in the chain. And by size, I mean that if you have a knot here and you start cutting off from both ends, then this is essentially whatever remains uh, defines the size of the knot. And as, as all of you will know that uh, um, the knot spectrum, of course, is also different because if you have something with a knotting probability of 80%, you will not only observe trefoil knots, but many, many very complicated knots, whereas in the polymoid melt, with a knotting probability of 10%, you only observe or mostly observe trefoil knots over here. And uh, when I put the transparencies together, I actually realized that this is also an indication of knot localization in these melts. So this exponent is smaller than one, so they are weakly localized in the melt. All right, uh, so we were thinking hard uh, about how to save the day and uh, come up with some other ideal chain models to, um, to take these effects into account. Uh, however, we, we didn't really succeed. So I will just present you one of these failed attempts um, because I think it's, it's a very interesting model and I, I was not aware of it actually before talking to, to Nathan Clisby uh, at another conference in the beginning of this year. So this is actually published in, in a conference uh, proceeding uh, from, from back then. So um, this model I'm talking about now is called the finite memory walker. Yeah? So this is essentially a mixture between self-avoiding walk and uh, random walk. So up to a certain interaction distance, so if you have a beat here, you regard it as a, as a self-avoiding walk, and beyond that, it's just a, a random walk, yeah? So in the vicinity, it's a self-avoiding walk, and for larger scales, it's, it's a random walk. And uh, if you um, change this interaction length, so you go from nearest neighbor to, you know, 30 beats on each side, uh, the nodding probability, of course, changes from the random walk and approaches a probability that you would get for a self-avoiding walk in the limit of interaction range equal to chain size. Okay, so this already looks kind of okay, but you already see here that it's difficult to really get down to 10%. So even for interaction range to 30, it didn't really work out. And um, what, uh, when we finally realized that this is not really working is when we looked at the probability for finding a trefoil noid of a particular size. Yeah, so this is over here. So here you get the, the, the distribution or the probability distribution essentially for the random walk. Here you get it for the self-avoiding walk. This is our chain in the melt. And uh, what you observe here, so for instance, for a finite memory walker of size 30, um, you follow the distribution of the self-avoiding walk until interaction range 30. And then it jumps, essentially, and uh, approaches the distribution of the random walk. So this is, again, an indication that up to the interaction range, uh, it behaves like a self-avoiding walk. But beyond that, it behaves like a random walk. And in, in no case, we can ever you know, obtain the distribution which we get for the melt. And we, we also tried other things, like you know, reducing the excluded volume for, of all chains, and, and all, all these kind of models didn't really work. So let me just briefly mention what actually did work. And these are uh, Teta chains. So if you remember from the, the first, uh, the second transparency, um, so I was showing you this, this, this case where we have a uh, self-avoiding walk, which when we uh, put it in bad solvent condition, it collapses to a globular state, and the theta point is actually exactly the transition point. And again, when you go to polymer theory class, uh, people will tell you that uh, at the transition, the energetic attraction and the entropic propulsion essentially cancel out each other, and again, this should be treated as a random walk. So um, we tested that, and what we did is we changed the temperature in our model, or the solvent quality, if you like, until the end-to-end -end distance uh, was the same as in the melt. And when we now look at the uh, knotting probabilities, 
we see that uh, they are very similar to the polymers in the world. So the difference is about one to one to two percent. And you have to keep in mind that the model now is slightly different because uh, the, the polymers in the melt are essentially athermal, whereas now we, of course, we need some attraction to to uh, enforce the transition. All right. So this already looks quite promising. So, and when we look now at the distribution, again, so we are looking at the probability of finding a trefoil knot uh, of a particular size. Uh, now it all matches up, and we essentially reproduce with our theta polymer uh, the, the distribution of a polymer in the melt. So that essentially means two things. First of all, theta polymers are not random walks either, but if you want... Uh, um, Okay, so maybe I should state that more carefully. <laughs> but if you want a single chain model that reproduces the structures of chains in the melt, um, actually a, a theta polymer does a very good job. Yeah? So the knotting probabilities are very, very similar, and, um, and, and this is sort of our, our best guess for, for describing polymers in, in melts. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, of, of course, you, there are similar arguments for polymers in the melt. So, there are the, the, the people from Strasbourg who say that there are logarithmic corrections to that. And, and the same applies, essentially, to the theta polymers, yeah. So, that's, that's completely correct. All right, so let me switch gears a little bit and talk about a related uh, topic, uh, namely ring melts. And I only mentioned that briefly uh, because it, it uh, created quite some attention uh, also from people not in the knotting community, namely for the description of chromosome ther uh, the territories. So here there's a nice picture from 2005. And this is essentially shows you the distribution of chromosomes uh, in the nucleus. And you can see that they are quite localized, so uh, a particular chromosome occupies a certain amount of space. And the reason for that is, even though they are like open chains, um, that this is probably a highly non-equilibrium state, yeah? and that the equilibrium time is just very large. I've read papers which calculated it to be something like uh, 300 years or something like that. So um, you are essentially looking at a non-equilibrium uh, conformation. And um, so there were... Uh, lots of discussions where people would come up with a model from polymer physics which sort of reproduces a similar behavior, and these are so-called ring melts. So now we have unknotted uh, a melt of unknotted rings, and you can see already over here in comparison to the open chain melt that the chains tend to be much more localized, and this is uh, how people draw the analogy between the two. And uh, we also did some simulations uh, using GPU, with the QMD molecular dynamics program. And uh, the results were actually published in the conference proceeding from a uh, conference of, from organized uh, by Tetsu Degushi in 2011. And you can see here that the scaling actually uh, approaches uh, one third, or if you have the squared radius of gyration, uh, two thirds. And this is actually an indication that these chains in the melt, the ring chains in the melt, they behave like globular structures. And when you look at them, you see that they are almost like a, like a real globule. And then, just for the fun of it, we also put knots in there. So, again, this has no connection to real biology, but just, we did, just did it nevertheless. And uh, what we observe there is essentially that for very small chains, so if you have a chain of size 100 and you make a melt of these chains, the knot essentially occupies the whole chain, and it reduces the... Um, the size of the chain considerably. So in this region, we see a big difference between, let's say, three one-knotted chains and five one-knotted chains as compared to the unknotted rings over here. However, when you increase the chain size uh, to a couple of thousand, um, they sort of approach each other, and they also go to the one-third scaling limit over here, just like the rings. And this is, again, an indication, at least, that knots tend to be localized, and if you just make the chain long enough, the presence of the rod doesn't really make a big difference um, anymore. All right, so this is uh, what I wanted to say about melts, and now we'll go back to single chains and cause, how coarse grained models uh, can be helpful in this context. So this is just an introductory slide I, I copied from, from uh, Oxford nanopore sequences. You can find many of those like in the internet. So this is the how uh, nanopore sequencing is supposed to work. So this is a new emerging technology, uh, and people are very excited about it. 
uh, to replace so-called next generation sequencing uh, devices. And the idea um, is you have a pore, so this can be a biological pore or a synthetic pore, and you uh, thread a single DNA, so this is double strand DNA over here, and here uh, it's separated into a single strand. You thread that through here. Here's a little piece which sort of holds the chain in place. And uh, all the time you apply a voltage across the membrane so that ions can flow through the pore. And depending on what bases are located uh, at the bottleneck of this pore, you get a different electrical signal. And then this can be correlated to the bases. Um, so to my knowledge, um, um, so this thing is still sort of under development. So it's not ready yet to really replace next generation sequencing devices. Um, but uh, if they sort of get rid of these problems, this is very uh, interesting because these devices can be made very cheaply. So you can buy one of those things from, from this company for $1,000. Um, and uh, so this could really revolutionize uh, and, and bring this thing uh, to your doctor's office or even you know, in your pocket uh, eventually, if, if, if it works at some point. <laughs> I should say. And one of the advantages of this uh, nanopore sequencing is actually that you can uh, thread uh, very long chains through this device. Yeah? So currently, only about 5,000 to 10,000 base pairs. And uh, later on, you, you will see that you know, this might also be connected to knots at some point. Um, but the, the, the vision is clearly to extend that to much larger chains and eventually sequence hundreds of thousands of base pairs in in a single run. All right, so how do we model DNA? So, uh, so this is kind of the, the DNA uh, which we all have in mind, and uh, I think this is from Wikipedia, actually. Um, so this is DNA in all its atomistic glory. Uh, of course, if we want to determine knotting probabilities for half a million base pairs, I mean, this is not the, the model one should choose. So we, again, take a physicist's approach and sort of zoom out uh, a little bit and then DNA starts looking like that. Yeah? And this is something we know how to handle with coarse grain models. So this is essentially your, your uh, semi-flexible polymer. And um, there are certain components which you have to take into account. Uh, maybe the most important is the stiffness. Then one should also take account uh, exclude volume interactions. So again, I don't want to go into details here. But if you just treat it uh, as an idle chain or a warm-like chain, um, you will not get the correct results. And uh, finally, one can think about electrostatics, but it turns out that these electrostatics are actually screened, so we don't need to take them into account explicitly, but what we do is we sort of incorporate them in some kind of effective thickness, and this is pretty much along the uh, line of uh, a paper from Wologotsky in the early 90s, uh, which uh, also tried to, to come up with such a model, uh, based on knotting probabilities from 5,000 to 10,000 base pairs. However, in their model, they made an additional assumption, namely that the persistence length of DNA is uh, 50 nanometer. And in contrast to that, uh, we didn't do that. So we just took their experimental data. And of course, fitting becomes much more complicated by then and uh, come up with parameters for the stiffness and the effective thickness of our beads. And as a consistency check, so this is also more for the people interested in polymer physics. We actually determined the, um, the persistence length of this chain, and it turns out that it's exactly 50 nanometers. So again, this is an indication that if you get the knotting spectrum right and you have the, 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 a good coarse grain model, then this will also give you other structural properties of your chain. For instance, the persistence length. All right. So let's look at the, the probabilities. So if you go beyond 200,000 base pairs with this coarse grain model, uh, already more than 50% of your chains are knotted. Yeah? And it's actually interesting from an historic perspective because this first model, by, first paper by Wologotsky in 74, they already made some predictions about knotting in DNA. But of course, this was based solely on a random walk, and they tend to overpredict the probability of DNA. So they are like, uh, you know, like somewhere over here, maybe, if you do it with a pure random walk model. But nevertheless, I, I think it, it's actually quite amazing. All right, um, uh, then most of the knots are, of course, trefoil knots. And uh, recently, um, 
actually, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a paper published by uh, the K. Stecker group, uh, Kellen Blazer and, and uh, Shura uh, Grossberg was also involved in that, which uh, gave us new data on um, long DNA chains using solid state nanopores. And of course, our work at that point was completely independent from them, so we didn't use their data to fit anything, but we were using the data from the early 90s. And you can see that they actually match uh, quite nicely. So this is uh, experimental values for one molar KCL. However, it's not a perfect match because what we are looking at is a physiological salt concentration. So the, for physiological concentration, we probably expect it to be somewhere over here. Yeah? But nevertheless, I think it's, it's quite amazing that independently we, we came to the same conclusions using experiment and computer simulations. We can also now determine uh, sort of the typical size of such a, a knot uh, by looking at the distribution and we define the trefoil diameter as something like two times the radius of duration and the most likely size is around 200 nanometer and that doesn't really change if you increase uh, the size of your DNA. And uh, after all, this is a, a topic which really needs to be addressed, in my opinion, at least if one wants to go beyond, uh, let's say, the five or 10,000 base pairs which are currently uh, investigated with these devices. And um, so what will happen actually, so here's actually you know, uh, sort of a plot which gives you some ideas about scale. So this is DNA of 16,000 base pairs. This is the typical size of your knot over here. These are typical sizes of nanopores. So five nanometer, 10 nanometer, uh, 20 nanometer, and you see already that this is kind of a floppy object. Yeah, so it will not probably clog your nanopore sequencing device uh, or, or get stuck or something like that. But nevertheless, it might influence the ionic current, and, and this is probably the more serious problem. And there are actually some 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 very nice uh, papers on the dynamics uh, by one of the organizers, uh, the group of Christian Micheletti, uh, which sort of uh, address the dynamics of uh, how how you thread such a chain through a hole. And uh, so our paper was also just published last week, actually, after some journey, <laughs> Odyssey, I should call it. And, and one of the remarks of the referees was that we should not only look at trefoil knots and figure of eight knots, but also at the complete knotting spectrum. And there we, we actually made a, quite an interesting discovery, namely that uh, the knots which are more complicated than trefoil knots are not other prime knots, but they are composite knots of trefoil knots. So up to 500,000 base pairs, you essentially just observe trefoils, two trefoils, three trefoils, and, and very few other knots, actually. So that's uh, interesting. So for instance, here we have uh, the figure of eight knot, and compare that with uh, the probability of observing two trefoil knots, or even three trefoil knots. Uh, let me see uh, this curve over here. Yeah? So in some cases, it's even more likely to observe three trefoil knots than observing uh, one figure of eight knot. And it's, it's a high, uh, highly non-trivial thing, actually, because uh, one could argue, okay, maybe this is just the product probability, but that doesn't add up either. So currently, we, we don't have a really good uh, theoretical model of, of how these things actually come into being. So this also gives me uh, the, the chance to, to talk a little bit about the dynamics of these composite knots, and this is... Uh, a project which has um, uh, emerged as kind of a fun project and uh, goes back actually quite a few, uh, few years uh, when I was still a postdoc with Meran Kada and, and at some point he was suggesting such a project as sort of a, uh, an interesting thing to look at. And, but it, it took like uh, in the end like 10 more years to, to really uh, get it done. So what we have here are two plates and we have a polymer confined between these two blades and you have like two knots. So one over here and one over here. And then you just do your molecular and dynamic simulation. I also have a video of that with music, but, but I think 90% of the people have already seen that more than five times. <laughs> so <laughs> I decided to, to just make the, the pictorial thing this time. So what you see is essentially that these knots can actually go back and through each other back and forth. Yeah? And this is actually something which is sort of counterintuitive to begin with, but if you think about it, it's actually not that difficult to understand. But before I come up with a solution, so let me just show you how we analyze that. So this is essentially uh, the distance between the locations of the two knots. So if you have a positive number, that means that the green knot is over here and the, the red knot is over here. 
if the distance is zero, we are in this intermediate state where they are intertangled. And if we are negative uh, distance, it means that they have changed positions. And then the trajectory looks a little bit like that. So it goes back and forth and spends some time in this intermediate duration. So what you can do is you can just project that uh, onto this axis and you get a probability distribution. And uh, as good physicists, we know that probability distributions are always related to free energies. So if you take the negative logarithm of this thing, you get something like a topological uh, free energy. And you can see that depending on how far the walls are apart, uh, this is actually um, the intermediate state becomes more likely or the separated state becomes more likely. Of course, if you push the walls very close, the knots would like to stay in the intermediate state where the two are intertangled. And if you, you know, pull them really apart, then they would like to be separated. And uh, so one of the questions is, okay, what, what actually happens in, 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 in real uh, DNA or real polymers and when you don't have these, these walls. And uh, so we did Monte Carlo simulations and analyzed uh, configurations which just had these two specific uh, knots in there. And then we did essentially the same analysis. And what turns out, if you go to very long chains, that uh, each state is more or less uh, equally likely. So this over here is because you reach the end of the chain. So for an infinite chain, you would expect this to be flat. But in the middle, uh, you still get a, a very, very small dip. Yeah? And uh, this is, again, the intermediate state. But if you look at the scale over here, this is only about 1 kT. So what we observe here is that uh, the combined state in which the two knots are intertangled is slightly preferred to the state where the two are uh, separated. And of course, this is a purely entropic effect. So we have something like an entropic interaction or entropic attraction of knots. But as the effect is very small, um, so still take that with a grain of salt. Oh, this is just how we define it. So if you have a, a knot over here and a knot over here, and they change positions, then, then this is negative. Yeah? So, but of course, this distribution should, should be symmetric. All right, so let's switch gears once again and come to the last, last topic, which is uh, knots and proteins. And uh, this is sort of just a, a summary maybe uh, about what uh, has been done in the, in the past couple of years from, from a theoretical point of view maybe. So people, including us, have looked uh, at knots in the protein data bank, and this has already been mentioned uh, uh, before, that knots tend to be very rare. So this is just sort of a... Uh, a semi-complete list of knots which occur there. Uh, so uh, currently we have 12 uh, knotted proteins, and uh, most of them are simple trefoil knots, uh, two figure of, uh, figure of eight knots, one five two, and one uh, six-fold knots, which was already um, mentioned before. And, you know, depending on, on how you compute these numbers, so you end up, so I think you were suggesting 2%, so I, I would probably go a little bit uh, even further down, so maybe to 1%. So these things are actually very rare. Yeah? And then, of course, a, a couple of questions emerge. And I think in the last 10 years, or when we last, at least compared to when we last met here in Trieste, I think some of the issues have made some progress, and we are now in a, in a more comfortable position, actually, to address some of these questions. So um, for instance, why are these not so rare? Okay, if you think about your, your globular polymer, at least from, from a polymer physics point of view, you know, you would think that you know, all proteins should be knotted, maybe. If you ask a biologist, you say no proteins will be knotted, but that's a different story. Um, then how do these things actually fold? Yeah? And there again, there have been very beautiful experiments by, by Sophie Jackson and, and, and very uh, interesting simulations and from, from Joanna and, and other people who really give us, I feel, a better understanding of what's going on there uh, these days. And um, so I'll talk a little bit about that also later on. So, but let me start with uh, sort of the newest addition to the protein knot family. Um, this is actually uh, very interesting before, because before we only had enzymes and uh, DNA binding proteins actually which contain knots, and for the first time, we've observed a knotted membrane protein. Yeah? And, and this is what it looks like. So these are two, um, two structures from uh, different subfamilies um, of this uh, transmembrane protein. 
And again, like questions like how do these things actually get into the membrane, how do they fold, all these things arise uh, once again. Um, we actually uh, had, with a bachelor's student, <laughs> uh, did a small literature research, and uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago, we came up with such a phylogenetic tree, which was done by somebody else, uh, namely uh, these guys over here, Pittman and Hershey, in a journal called RICE. Yeah? So this is a very, um, so to be frank, I didn't know that such a journal exists. Um, and it's not something uh, I read on a weekly basis as a physicist, I'd say. Um, but nevertheless, they, they made a phylogenetic tree of this family. And uh, one of the structures which has been resolved in the PDB is located down here, actually. And the other one is located over here, and so they go back to a common origin, and that actually is an indication, again, that uh, potentially the whole uh, superfamily actually contains that knot, and that is actually a very old structure. Uh, for the experts, uh, this is kind of interesting because the sequence identity between these two structures is only 10%. Yeah? That's uh, very uncommon. Typically, uh, structural homologues, they have at least like 30% sequence identity. All right, uh, so this is actually uh, something I'd, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about. So the, the regular thing is essentially when you find a knot in one protein, you will also find it in, in structural homologs. So as an example, I've picked this nice fivefold knot here, which is present in human, and there's also a, a homolog, which is present in yeast, and even though you know, at least in Germany, that there's a nice connection between yeast and human, uh, the idea is probably just like in the case before, that it goes back to a common ancestor, and that means that the structure is potentially hundreds of millions and maybe billions of years old. So the knot has been there for quite some time. And uh, an interesting side remark, which I tend to make at this point, is that this 5-2 knot has a structural homologue which is abundant in everybody's brain. Okay, so this is again a story people have heard probably like five or six times at least. Uh, so if you look very closely, it's located right over here. Um, so you can also make a kind of a back of the envelope calculation. And uh, when you add up the numbers, uh, you realize that 10 to the 19, so that everybody has 10 to the 19 to 10 to the 20 of these knotted molecules in your brain. And this was sort of an Heureka moment for me. Uh, but uh, there are also lots of funding opportunities, as pointed out uh, by David, I think, in the last uh, get-together in Warsaw. So this protein is related to Parkinson's disease and certain types of cancers. So, um, so maybe there's finally hope to, to get some funding for, for, for that as well. All right, so uh, then the question arises, um, if these knots are always preserved, and the answer is no, there's one counterexample, uh, which we found in, in 2006, and the, the protein is named transcarb amylase, and what you see over here uh, is the knotted homolog, at least the knotted part, and the unknotted homolog, which is located over here, so this is missing this arc over here, essentially, so you have to really look carefully to, to see that this thing is actually knotted and this is not. Um, and so how this came into being was maybe just by the deletion of the corresponding sequence in the gene. And this was actually, when I saw that for the first time, uh, a perfect candidate for creating an unknotted protein from a knotted one. But as you will see uh, soon, that this is not how it actually uh, played out. Um, however, there's also a very nice bioinformatics study by Raffaello and, and, and Christian. So if you want to, to learn about the origin of this particular knot, uh, you should have a look at that as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the difference actually is not that exciting, so it, it just catalyzes a slightly different reaction. So this carboxyl group over here moves uh, over here in the knotted version, and therefore we have some more space over here for an additional acetyl group. So in the end, it's, it's nothing really exciting. So this is nothing, you know, there have been, of course, lots of speculation, and people are still speculating what knots are really good for. In that case, uh, it's, it's probably not that exciting. The current speculations are that it maybe improves resistance against degradation or thermal fluctuations and these things. Uh, and there's actually some, some evidence by, by simulation at least which uh, support this claim. All right, so let's move on. Um, this is again, I think, another milestone uh, in the field which, which came into being uh, after the last three years conference. Uh, and this is the, the first creation of an artificial uh, knot in the group of Todd Yates. So what they did is they 
took a, a homodimeric structure and connected the end of one protein with the beginning of the other one, and by doing that, they created an artificial trefoil knot, and it actually folds into this knotted structure. And it's also what probably happened uh, in the beginning uh, when these structures came into being in the first place. So um, when you look at the structure, many of them actually still have remains of, of these dimeric structures in them. So that, from a, from a protein engineering perspective, I find very exciting because, you know, maybe at some point this will be just uh, within the toolbox of, you know, how you design proteins, and not just structure, but also topology will eventually play a role in there. So very interesting. Um, the last thing, or the second to last thing I would like to address is um, the, the issue of folding. And this is actually a simulation I did uh, about 10 years ago. Um, so this is, again, where coarse grain models uh, play a role. So you have your basic polymer model, so you have some extra volume, spring potentials, angle potentials, torsion potentials. And in addition, you have something like a native potential, uh, which uh, essentially gives uh, a negative energy contributions to uh, amino acids which are close to each other in the native state. Yeah? So this way, you enforce that the protein will actually fold into the correct conformation. And Again, I quickly realized that there are experts in this uh, which are much better in this than myself. And, and one expert is also here, um, Joanna. Okay. Joanna is, uh, so she's the one who's, who's really uh, uh, has, has uh, progressed this field considerably uh, with these kind of simulations. And so I was fortunate to publish this paper together with her uh, where we looked at the folding of this six-fold knot and this looks already quite complicated. So give, let me give you my poor man's version of it. So again, you see this uh, dimeric structure over here, the red part and the blue part, and those are connected uh, by this uh, wide arc, if you want. And if you just flip that over, uh, the knot essentially disentangles. So even though you may have a very complicated knot to begin with, in the end, it may not be so difficult to fold. Huh? But again, you know, these are coarse grain simulations, and uh, they are just here essentially to give you a, a feeling for, for these kind of things. And of course, this needs to be confirmed with, with corresponding experiments. All right, so the last topic, um, in sort of to, to, to close the circle, uh, once again, uh, so I will talk uh, about a, a coarse grained toy model, which is very popular among physicists, namely the so called HP model. H stands for hydrophobic, and P for polar. So this is essentially uh, a lattice protein, uh, which has the, the, uh, the property that in low energy states or native-like states, uh, it forms a hydrophobic core, just like in real proteins. Yeah? And this, this model is, goes back to Ken Dill in 1985 and has been uh, popular amongst physicists at least ever since. And uh, so with this model, uh, I, I wanted to, to address the question, why knots are so rare in proteins? Um, so first I thought, actually, the formation of this hydrophobic core over there may have something to do with the rarity of the knot. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, this didn't out, turn out to be true. So what we did here, we simulated 100 sequences, the size of each. Uh, so we have 50% H, 50% uh, P and um, uh, chains of size 500 and determine knotting probabilities of native-like states. So these are very low energy states of that model. And uh, of course, um, I need to point out that this model has uh, significant degeneracy, so these ground states are not unique, so which actually enables us to determine these knotting probabilities. Um, but, and uh, let me just remind you that these are very difficult simulations, yeah? So again, I tried it on my own and realized that, that this is too difficult for me. And I had to team up with Thomas Wiest, who is sort of the world leading expert for this type of models. And even with him and very optimized code and using all the tricks of the trade, we still needed like 5 million CPU hours to, to get this graph. Yeah? So, so don't try this at home <laughs> if you have to. So, um, so if you look at the, the mean knotting probability and compare that with a homopolymer of a similar density, you essentially end up with the same, uh, more or less the same knotting probabilities. So it doesn't really make a difference if you have a hydropolymer or a homopolymer. Um, however, um, you see that there is some variance here. So you have sequences which are more prone to be knotted and sequences 
uh, which are less prone to be nodded. So this uh, led us to the idea that we can sort of intelligently design sequences which contain very few knots or many knots, actually. Yeah? And uh, just to put this into perspective, so this will give nature a route to evolve to a universe which is, is actually uh, unknotted. So, okay, I've already used up all of my time, so let me just uh, skip through that very quickly. So the unknotted states in this protein lattice universe, they are more like these sandwich-like structures. And here, you can also construct states which go back and forth. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more about that in the coffee break. And this already brings me to the end of my talk. And to sort of, if I have to put uh, everything into context again, uh, the only thing I, I'd like to say is that, you know, the use of these coarse grain models can be very useful for addressing specific issues not only in, in polymer science, but also in, this, in the context of molecular biology. And this is actually something I believe uh, we as physicists can contribute to this community. And with this, I'd like to close. And thank you for your attention.